What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to Believe 2024. It is April 2nd today, so this is a real report. I skipped April 1st to make you think it wasn't April Fool's, uh, and uh, we didn't have an intermediary episode. It's another check-in with Brian a month later. We're now entering the 20th week post-competition season, and we are officially weighing in 88.14 for the weekly average last week and 87.96 for the two-weekly average. So we've hit the body weight target that we anticipated to be hitting like six months from now, six months early. And arguably, I think we are leaner than anticipated. So there's good gains. There's, oh man, we crushed it better than we thought. And then there's whatever the hell I'm experiencing, which feels like, almost like my newbie gains, to be honest. I expected to make some good gains, stepping away from strength sport, not having to juggle powerlifting, strongman or weightlifting. Um, you know, choosing better exercises with a better stimulus to fatigue ratio, longer muscle lengths, training closer to failure, and also increasing my volume and also being incredibly motivated and just doing everything in my power outside of the gym to support my gains. I expected it to be good. I did not expect it to be this good. And Brian, you've been really helpful for encouraging me that, yeah, this is going really well, because I've been thinking, you know what, I'm rationalizing this, I'm gaining far more body fat than I think I am, because my weight gain has happened so quickly. And I think it's been really interesting, because it, it only makes sense for it to have been mostly lean gains to this point, because of the rate at which I've gained muscle, or the weight at which I have gained weight in a relatively small surplus. And I think I talked about this in a previous Believe, I encourage you to watch it if you want. Lean tissue is only like one seventh of the energy uh, value of a similar mass of body fat. So I remember when I first started weight training and when most people who are trying to gain weight when they first start lifting and they're having their, their newbie phase, their honeymoon phase, you gain weight without really trying. I put on you know 20 pounds in six months without feeling like I was doing anything different. And you, your, your hunger gets stimulated and with a very small surplus, you can gain a fair amount of muscle because you're just creating that much of a stimulus because your threshold for gains is so low. So anyway, I feel like I'm experiencing that again, which is pretty cool, but I, it's just not expected at this stage during recovery as a 40 year old advanced bodybuilder who thought I was pretty close to capped out. So your feedback and the feedback of others has been really helpful. Seeing the logbook, I'm crushing the weights in the gym but I had something um, booked that I was really excited to do, which was a ISAC um, anthropometry profile that I did three weeks ago. And this was um, something that was really helpful for me to get some objective numbers to actually see like, am I crazy or not? So pretty cool thing that I did way back in July, I participated in a study that we're eventually gonna publish, shout out to Kai Homer, this was part of his master's. Uh, where I was in a crossover study looking at different peak week protocols. I wasn't all the way in stage condition. Um, I was weighing in around 83-ish, so I was about three, four kilos over stage weight. Uh, but I was lean enough to participate in a study where we did like a mock peak week. We did placebo-controlled um, crossover trial. So we got a, a drink that either had maltodextrin to carb us up, and then we took pictures and did an ISAC profile, which I'll explain what that is in more detail in a second. Um, and then we did one with just a flavor matched, but calorie free drink. I got this full ISAC profile carved up. So it's relatively comparable conditions to this um, more recent one that I got three weeks ago. So what the heck is ISAC? That's the International Sports uh, Society for Sports Can Anthropometrists. And it is a research based society uh, that has uh, certain standards for doing anthropometry. So measuring skin folds, measuring uh, bone breadths and girths and estimating uh, body fat to be certified through it. And there's four certification levels. You have to have extremely small errors. So you measure the same site and you get the same measurement multiple times and you have to do dozens of profiles to get there and you have to maintain it. Kai is certified as well as my colleague, Dr. Alyssa Joyce Spence. And I got measurements from both of them, uh, one three weeks ago. And like I said, the other one back in July. Now I've got a side-by-side -side comparison that I wanna show you guys. But before I show it to you, I wanna talk through some of the limitations of this data. This should be hopefully educational. Most people think that skin folds are one of the worst measurements of body fat and that they're highly unreliable. And that is only partially true. If you get a body fat percentage from skin fold measurements, yes, that is true. However, they're actually the most reliable. Yes, you heard me, the most reliable, meaning that the precision of error is small. And if you do repeated measures, you're gonna get very comparable conditions with a small technical error of measurement. It's more 
uh, reliable than even DEXA. And that's when you're looking at the skin fold comparisons themselves. You can see that when you just use skin folds, you don't derive a body, body composition from it. Estimations of, uh, of, of body composition change are the most reliable when using surface skin folds done well, like by an ISEC can anthropometrist. Most people, they want to know a body fat percentage, but honestly, it's an arbitrary number that means nothing. I actually care far more about um, the actual skin fold thicknesses because that's what directly is going to, uh, you know, that's my subcutaneous fat layers, what obscures my muscularity and what I need to get lower to look good on stage. So if we look here on the left, you can see these two profiles side by side. Um, we have my comparison back in July. This was done July 15th, my morning weigh-in. I've cropped in there. You can see I was 84.4, so that's a carbed up, so comparable to the off-season body weight. And then you see what I've circled in red are the, the things that are the same between these two different profiles. The most recent one I got was a little more extensive. I did a level two full profile and the, the, the one on the left is a restricted level one profile because we just wanted to get some, some girths and skin fold thicknesses. We didn't need all the bone breaths and everything else. Um, but then I got the full profile recently. So I've, I've highlighted what is maintained from the restricted profile to the, the full profile so we can compare. So uh, first off, we are starting with eight sites of skin fold measurements. We got triceps, subscapular, biceps, iliac crest, super, supraspinale, abdominal thigh, and calf. Now here are where those measurements actually are. So you can see them. We have three upper body measurements, front and back of the arms, upper back. Then we have three kind of trunk measurements, two on the front, one kind of on the lateral side. And then we've got an anterior thigh, so your quad, and then your calf as a measurement. So we're not measuring, you know, glutes and hams, which you'll see is probably one of the reasons why these are so comparable. So there are some, are some, are some limitations here. And then as far as the girth that are comparable, we got a relaxed and flexed arm. We got waist, we got hips, which includes, you know, my butt. And then we have my thigh girth and my calf girth. So we have some decent comparisons for maybe uh, an idea of how lean and how muscular I am compared from now until then. And then at the bottom, you can see we have the sum of eight. And that's probably the most useful metric because there are gonna be some errors due to the fact that Alyssa and Kai are two different people. So I had two different assessors. So there's inter-rater reliability and there's intra-rater reliability. Intra-rater reliability is much better, uh, but it's still quite good between two ISAC uh, practitioners because they use the same methods, the same landmarks, and the same uh, techniques. And each one of them is quite reliable. So even when you compare between two ISAC professionals, it says surprisingly good inter-rater reliability, but not perfect. But once you average that out across eight sites, um, it tends to get a lot better. So I think there's a, it's a pretty decent comparison here when we look at the sum of eight, okay? So let's just look at that real quick. You can look here on the right. My sum of eight skin folds three weeks ago when I had a weigh-in of 88, just over 88, 88.1, 88 was 39. And it was 84 and at 84.4 back in July, it was 35.5. So only 3.5 millimeters more across eight sites being 3.5 kilograms heavier. So gaining one millimeter across eight sites for every kilogram of body mass is incredibly lean gains. And it makes me know, oh, I'm not crazy. This is going really well. Um, and also I think it's really interesting that my body fat distribution has changed. Now, one thing you're probably thinking is, well, should we be looking at these individual sites? What about that inner rater reliability issue? Well, I think what we also have that's quite cool is this morning, I took some updated um, progress pictures. And I tried to replicate the same lighting that we used for the study. Because in the study, when we eventually publish it, we're gonna have bodybuilding judges with the face blacked out compare the physique. So what you see here is I've replicated the same pictures. And this is again, this is not three weeks ago. This was this morning. So if anything, I'm a little bit higher in body fat than I was during this profile. And you can see comparing a front relaxed. And you can tell here that comparable leanness may be just a little bit softer. The lighting's not a perfect match, but I do think I look a little bit bigger. You can see here a most muscular, where I really do feel like I've gained a lot of thickness recently. And if anything, I think my upper body actually looks a little leaner. Uh, you can see here a uh, frontal bicep. You can see here my side shots. I've got a side tricep. Um, and this is, I think, really telling of the how lean my upper body has stayed post-comp, at least especially my arms. And here is a side chest, another good comparison where you can see compared to back in July uh, versus this morning, now, you know, 
geez, many, many, many months later, it's the beginning of April, uh, that I've definitely, I think I've put on some size while ma maintaining leanness. And then the shots from the back, the lighting isn't perfect to assess here, but it is comparable between the two. You can see both my uh, back relaxed. Um, here's where I think you can tell that I have put on some body fat, primarily in my lower posterior chain, glutes, hams, lower back, um, as well as a back double bicep and kind of telling the same thing, not quite as much hamstring or, or glute uh, leanness or separation. I've definitely put on some body fat there as well as my lower back, I think. So when we compare these pictures and, and, and then that kind of verifies what we're seeing in the sum of eight, I think that is pretty helpful. So you'll notice here, you can see that my triceps are actually leaner now than they were back in July. So some different body composition uh, distribution, which kind of makes sense. You know, back in July, I've been dieting since February. So slightly different hormonal environment, stress environment, um, and versus now I've gone through recovery and I've been in a surplus since um, middle of November. So, you know, going through that recovery process and then, you know, moving into the off season, most competitors notice their body fat distribution changes a little bit. So you can see here that my biceps are just as lean as they were. My triceps are a little bit leaner and very comparable um, uh, upper back level of leanness. That's probably within the measurement, of, measurement error of just 0.5 mils. And then where you can see where I've actually put on some body fat is those three middle body measurements. So the iliac crest, supraspinale, and abdominal, those are all around the waist. And those are all higher than they were back in the day. And that's primarily why my sum of eight is higher. And that makes sense, right? You know, if you're gaining body fat, um, gaining it around the midsection. But my quads and my calves are just as lean. So I think this might be overrepresenting how lean I've stayed. I think if we had like some hamstring and glute measurements, it would probably show um, the gain there as well. And I think that's primarily where I store it around the waist, glutes, hamstring, lower back. So I'm probably not, not like, in, I'm not quite as lean as I was in July by any means. And I think even less so um, as shown here. And also, you know, that my body weight of 84.4, yeah, it's carved up, but it was liquid. I'd probably be a little bit heavier with having eaten food. Um, so, you know, like if we take even the most conservative comparison here, we'd say, well, maybe it wasn't like 39, maybe it's more like 45. And actually, you know, your morning weigh-in was done a little bit earlier than that. That was once you got to the labs, so you had some fluids, maybe you're 87 and a half, and oh, you should have been 85. I mean, that's still... Worst case scenario, I'm two and a half kilos up or nearly six pounds in, in this comparison and only like six mils heavier. So now it's you know gone from being one mil to one kilo to one mil to one pound. And in both cases, that is really, really, really lean gains. And it just lets me know that I'm not crazy, that I haven't been having an emperor's has no clothes kind of situation here in my mind and that we've made really good progress. And finally, again, I took these pictures this morning. Um, and it's just confirmed what I've seen in the gym. Like when I watch myself train, I've noticed that I just look a lot bigger these days. And um, it's the biggest I've ever looked. Uh, like when I do curls or um, when I'm out, you know, doing uh, rows uh, or when I'm doing RDLs or, or even hamstring curls, I'm just noticing when I review my videos that I look pretty damn lean still considering it's almost 20 weeks post season. And that I'm up, geez, like nine kilos now from stage weight. I'm up almost 20 pounds, remembering that I competed around 79.5 or 175 pounds. And I'm approaching 200 pounds now. I'm in the high 190s for the Americans. And to be still this lean, it is uh, mind-boggling to me. This is the, the biggest I've ever been at this body weight. So it is very possible that we're going to see my stage weight go up. So overall, Brian, for the check-in, because I've been talking to the camera a little bit here, I have to say that I've been incredibly pleased with everything. Um, I don't know how long I can, you know, how long this is going to last, but we're going to keep going, right? Um, and I'm, you know, probably eating closer to 2,700, 2,800 calories. It's just where my hunger has put me. And considering I've, I've been allowing myself to do that more and more as I've seen that things have been going so well and considering the latest progress pictures. Um, we might have to slow it down at some point, or maybe it'll naturally slow down and I'll start not making as lean of gains. I'll start putting on body fat and it'll be a slower rate of weight gain because adipose tissue has more energy. So a smaller surplus will result in slower weight gain. We will see. Um, the only negative things I have to report right now, Brian, are that I'm starting to get some um, medial epicondylitis or quote unquote golfer's elbow, even though I've never played a round of golf in my life. Um, 
that I think it's just from all the high volume upper body training. I mostly notice it on rowing exercise and bicep stuff. Triceps seem to be fine, pressing is fine, and I can modify either the rep range or the, like, or the load uh, or the position on my arms, but not too much on certain exercises, or I can go BFR. Um, I'm not sure the best way to deal with this or what you think we should be doing, but I know that if I let it get out of hand, uh, no pun intended, that it will get pretty bad and interfere with my training. Um, but uh, I might just need to bite the bullet and just take, um, you know, like a week-long deload and drop my any any volume on exercises that, that bothers it. But um, yeah, or we can just go like a full two weeks of BFR and just training around it and see how that goes. I've done that for like a week and a half. I've done really high rep training, BFR training for one week, and it has gotten better, um, but it hasn't fully subsided. And I know if I ignore it or train through it, it does get pretty bad to the point where it actually forces me to take even longer off. So I don't want to be dumb. I do want to be proactive. It's not that bad, but I'd love to hear your thoughts or what you think would be a good idea to move forward with the, uh, the elbow pain, but that's really the only issue. Um, everything else is going great. So, um, yeah, I just want to say again, I really appreciate the feedback. You've kept me sane during these insane gains, and this is a great problem to have. Um, and I, my gut is telling me that we're going to start getting to the end of the road of these rapid gains. But, um, yeah, man, I, I think we should definitely run out the clock on them, and it'll become obvious. Like, once my bicep vein starts to, to fade a little bit, um, you know, that means I'm, I'm probably gaining... Uh, like the, le the leanest spots of my body right now, I think once they start to show a little bit of adipose tissue gain, then like, okay, something's happening here. But yeah, let me know your thoughts. And uh, thanks again for all your support. And thanks for everyone for watching. And uh, hopefully, um, we're going to keep riding this out. And we'll see an actual, like, advanced bodybuilder increase their stage weight. How often does that happen? It's like the unicorn. All right, team. Thanks so much for following along. And Brian, thank you for the coaching. What's up, man? So just watched your video and another really productive month in the books um, for this off season. So great job. Um, it was really cool to see the, the comparisons um, with the skin folds, you know, one millimeter difference with three and a half kilo increase in body weight. Like that's, that's awesome. And we sort of have opposite body fat distribution patterns, you and I. Um, so I think they're, you know, your lower body does look like it's put on a little bit more. Um, but even then, like you would expect everything else to be up more than it is, um, you know, if this was predominantly fat gain, right? So certainly heading in the right direction. And it's funny because, you know, I think being very like data focused can sometimes have its drawbacks because looking at the data alone it looks like okay things are things are exceeding like we need to pump the brakes um you know we're exceeding the rate that we want to go and we start to second guess ourselves when in reality in the midst of you know that those thoughts things are going as well as they possibly could and so it's it's just kind of ironic um but yeah, where I really noticed it, you know, visually, I wouldn't even need to see data to know that you put on muscle mass, um, you know, arms, shoulders, um, or where it really sticks out, I think chest as well. And, you know, with the, I'm sure lower body has continued to make good progress. And I think that's more of just, a, you know, having a little bit more body fat um, in the hamstrings and glutes than, um, than you did previously. But again, I think that's overall, it's very visually evident that we're making progress. So, um, yeah, we'll keep it rolling. And I think this is a good, you know, also lesson for anybody watching with regards to the training. Like we haven't really changed much. And I think it's it's a easy to want to kind of program hop um, from time to time. And, you know, for the most part, Eric, you've we, we've stuck to the same kind of bread and butter approach that we've had. I know you switch gyms and, you know, some of the exercise selection changed a little bit, but our overall volume and everything is has stayed you know, rep range is more or less in place. You know, we had to audible with the hamstring, um, doing some BFR and everything, but, um, yeah, the stuff that, that works is, you know, sometimes it might feel a little bit mundane after a while and not every session is going to be perfect, but, you know, obviously consistency with a reasonably sound program. And I think we happen to dial things in pretty well for you, but even with a program that maybe, you know, for some people is suboptimal, you know, potentially, you know, if they execute it with intent and consistency, then, 
you know, good things follow. So, um, and I think a lot of probably what you're seeing is, is probably related to behaviors. And, you know, I was just talking to another athlete about this today, just with regards to momentum, you know, once you, once you get some positive reinforcement with behaviors and, you know, if you dial things in and you start to, you know, with sleep, recovery, stress levels, and you start to see progress, it's certainly a lot easier to keep it rolling. And then things just tend to snowball. So I would suspect um, the one area that I'm curious here is, you know, you would wonder if things would start to slow down. And I think on paper, it doesn't really make sense why we would make the gains that we have. I think other than the fact that maybe we're just managing the training fatigue better with, you know, exercise selection and focusing more on you know, quote unquote, bodybuilding movements, but, um, you know, you're, you're getting to a point in your off season, we have plenty of runway to work with in terms of gaining, um, at least in terms of body fat and conditioning, like we're, there's no mini cut imminent by any means. So, um, it wouldn't surprise me if things continued down this route, to be honest, especially with the momentum we have. Um, I think the environment is going to be more conducive to it as we go along. So um, potentially things might get even better. So that's pretty much it, dude. Um, let's see, what else? Oh, for the elbow. So it sounds like, I know you messaged me, said things have kind of cleared up since you sent that. But I think the the one thing that's helped me is... Um, and shout out to like Kasim, you know, for kind of planting this seed, um, in my mind with regards to single joint movements and using cables to really line up the direction of force to just oppose the joint that we're working in. So, you know, for tricep extensions, for example, there's no like sideways or rotational force occurring at the elbow. It's just opposing elbow extension. And so, you know, getting that cable in line, um, you know, with your elbow, same plane as your elbow, I think helps. I know it helps me. Um, like I can do like an overhead dumbbell extension, feel a little bit of strain on, on my elbows. But if I go to cables, that, that tends to clear up pretty quick as long as I line up the cable right. And I think that goes for a lot of isolation stuff. If you work with the joint and not, you know, apply any lateral forces to the joint, I think things um, in my experience, tend to feel quite a bit better. And that's, you know, a good piece that, you know, I picked up from him. So, um, so yeah, that, that's all I got. Um, let's just keep it rolling. I think we're, we're going to end up probably at least 90 plus, you know, in uh, probably over 90 in this off season. And, you know, we'll have to start to figure out whether or not you're thinking of pulling the trigger in uh, 2025 for competing or if you'd rather wait a bit, but um, nothing changes for the time being. I think we continue to continue with the path we're going and um, making gains and just riding this this wave that we're in. So um, I think it's also, the, part of this is, is a good reminder to me as well as a coach, just seeing, you know, pulling back a bit from those big three is, it, it, let's ignore the stimulus to fatigue ratio for a second and just think of like the time aspect. I think that alone, you know, if I squat and deadlift, that takes up a good chunk of the session. And then I might be leaving some quality volume on the table and quality stimulus there. So, um, you know, the fact that we can make things a little bit more time efficient by not doing those movements, sneak a little bit more volume in and still have it, you know, be you know, a good stimulus to fatigue ratio, you know, whatever um, we want to term that. But, you know, it's it's the idea um, that we're getting a good stimulus with a relatively low cost associated with it. So, um, yeah, I think we just keep going down that path and we'll just see where it takes us. So let me know if you have any questions. Um, hope you enjoy your weekend and I'll talk to you soon. All right, man. Later.